welcome to today's lesson. I know that uh, we were going to broadcast this on Sunday, but we had some technical difficulties, so we're re-recording that. And uh, going forward, and we may do this in the near future, just where we have the message recorded and placed online for you all so you can see it. Uh, that will be over at our uh, YouTube page. You can go to that. That is at myllba.com slash YouTube. All you have to do is type that in. That's myllba.com slash YouTube all together. And that will take you over there to our uh, YouTube page. You can subscribe and feel free to like and share our videos there. We just want to be able to get the word out to everybody and be able to encourage you guys with God's word. Today I want to talk about an intimate household and how the church needs, not even just needs, it requires us to be an intimate household. I've heard of so many congregations that only have this uh, kind of anonymous feel to them. And everybody just comes in sits in their places, sometimes even designated their places. They, if you go and sit in their seat, they're going to grab hold of you and lay into you. Uh, but what we need to be able to do is understand why the church is what it needs to be, and that is an intimate household. When you come to Greensburg or you come to Mount Gilead, you're not going to come around a bunch of strangers. Sorry, you're just not. You're going to be welcomed into the family. That's what our goal is here, is to make you feel at home. We want you to be able to laugh with us, enjoy time with us, and understand that you're as much a part of the family as we are. We want you to be accepted in. We are not going to force you to do anything you don't want to do, but we want you to be included, and we want you to have a blast. That's one of the things that the Church of Christ does. The Christian Church, Church of Christ, seeks to be a family first. We're not supposed to be a body of people that just come together once a week and mull over things. We should be people that are inspired to be here. Because, you know, like we talked about in last week's lesson, I brought up the question of whether churches today are engaged in the type of fellowship that we need to be practicing in the church and what the New Testament speaks of. And, of course, I ask questions like, uh, are the communities of believers expressing a sense of concern for one another? Or are they just simply people that are coming together and staying by themselves? And I consider the factors in our society which tempt us to be very self-centered and how an attitude of self-centeredness is foreign to the very basics of Christ's teaching about how the church should be. Today, I want to more carefully dig into the teaching of Jesus Christ concerning the nature of the church that he said he would build and how his teaching ought to shape the type of fellowship he wanted his members to have and to experience. Now, if you want to flip over to your Bibles to the section today, it's going to be in Matthew chapter 18. Now, I'm not going to start off there because I want to go and dig into some uh, contrasting views of what the church is according to many. And we'll look into this a little bit. There's some very different views of how mankind views the church. Modern men tend to look at it as an institution or an organization, a civic club or something like that. You know, you ever heard of a civic organization such as the JCs or uh, the American Legion or the Freemasons, any of these groups of people that come together and they run it in a very business style format. You have a president, a vice president, a secretary, a treasurer and all these different things. And that's how people look at the church these days. They see uh, these terms that businesses and corporations use a lot, like uh, budget and fiscal year and this, that, and the other. But you also find terms that are very much uh, seen as church terms, such as associate minister or uh, lead pastor or superintendent of education or director of music, these very large, lofty titles. And while the organization of the church is noted, there are instances in the uh, New Testament where it talks about the uh, church having organization to it at least some point. It does not and cannot be run like a business or a civic organization. 
We understand that civic organizations are absolutely wonderful at times. They go and they reach out to the community. They help build people. They help strengthen communities. But there is something more to the church. The church is not simply a business. It is not simply an organization. The church should not have a business-like structure to it. Business is very sterile. And it always has been. I was in management for years and years and years before I said, I'm done with this. I'm going to go and do what I need to be doing and building bodies of Christ and, and being able to encourage the body of Christ and the church as a minister, as a church planner, as whatever I can be to help and serve the Lord. But Jesus viewed the church very differently. He wasn't a businessman. You see, Christ was very much a people person. He was not just a people person, he was also a family person. And people that no one had any respect for came to him. And he did not just show them respect, he showed them care, love, and compassion. And those are terms that are very much a part of what God does with his church. You see, he viewed the church as a family who came together to do his will and the Father's will. Now you can cross-reference that in Matthew chapter 12 verses 46 through 50 if you'd like to. Uh, it's Matthew chapter 12 46 to 50. Now indeed both Jesus and his apostles often use the term family in speaking about the church. Jesus would go and he say in like in John chapter 2 verse 16 where he called God the Father, as His Father. He is also our Father, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. That's how we are taught to pray. But also with that, He taught His followers to go and speak to God and address God as their Father. And the apostles referred to the church as a brotherhood, as 1 Peter 2.17 says, and as the house or family of God, as, uh, as uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.15. So the church that Jesus established was not to be a sterile work environment. It was meant to be an intimate household. A household allowing a closeness not found in any other organization, business, or institution. The fact is, every aspect of the life of God's people is to manifest the closeness of the fam family and that intimacy that the family houses and holds dear. Now, how is our family to be seen? In church life. How is that supposed to permeate into our church life? Well, our relationship with one another is a big one. Let's have a look at what Matthew says in chapter 18 now. At chapter 18, verses 1 through 4. Let's read that together. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Well, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see, we're to be like little children. We're to be carefree, compassionate, open. I mean, Jesus called this young child to him, and that child did not hesitate, ran right to him, come there, and stood right there where Jesus stood with him and said, look, you guys got to be like this child, willing to come, willing to listen, willing to be a part of something greater. You see, it's not about showing stubbornness or being dominant over somebody, it has absolutely nothing to do with that. In fact, it is to show humility and submissiveness to one another and with dependence upon one another, just like a child is dependent upon its mother and father. The same way we are to be dependent upon one another. We should care for one another, just like we would our brothers and sisters in, real, in, in our real physical household our brothers and sisters, our sons and our daughters, our moms and our dads. 
we're to care for them in the exact same way. And that is also something that Jesus says because we should have concern for each other. Look what he says in the next verses here in uh, verse 5 and 7. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, Jesus isn't going and saying, you know, we need to promote capital punishment here in real life, but we should be willing to go as far as to defend our faith and defend those who are weak in their faith and dependent upon God. We should be protecting members of our family. You know, dads, I know you out there. I know you dads are listening, and I know that you've got beautiful daughters at your house that you would do anything to protect. You have daughters in your household where you have a boy come over to your house and he's starting to talk to your daughter. You might go to the gun cabinet and start polishing a few of them rifles. I know how it is. I've got a 13-year-old daughter who's going on 18, I think, and she is beautiful. She's got a good heart and a great mind, and she is beautiful inside and out. But that doesn't mean I want to see her get hurt. I don't want to just, well, you go on out there and do whatever you want to do. No, I want to protect my child. Just like you want to protect your children. And guess what? You, don't, you stand up for your brother and sister. You should. You should be willing to stand up and be willing to do the same for your brother and sister in real life or your brother and sister in the church life. Your physical brother and sister are just as important as your spiritual brother and sister. And vice versa, your spiritual brother and sister are just as important as your, as your physical brother and sister. Or they should be. That's how intimate we should be with one another. And when we are concerned with one another, we'll also be concerned with people who make mistakes or fall short. You go and look at verses 10 through 14 in, in Matthew chapter 18 here. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. You see, God doesn't want any to perish. Just as Peter said before, not that any should perish, but that all come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And likewise, we should care for our brothers and sisters in Christ the same way. We don't want to see anybody fall short. We want everybody that is a part of the body of Christ and those that are outside the body of Christ. We want to be able to encourage them to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, there is one area that a lot of churches just don't like to deal with, and that is the fact that we need to discipline one another, hold each other accountable. And today, a lot of accountability movements have started. I'm glad to see men actually keeping men accountable to one another. I have at least two guys that keep me accountable at all points that talk to me about my health, about my spiritual life, about every aspect of my family life, wants me to be a, want me to be able to care for the needs of my family as well as the body of Christ. And so we are accountable to one another. I do the same thing to them, helping them buffet and encouraging them to be built in the name of Jesus Christ. And so discipline is absolutely essential to that. We are to remember that we are brethren, and likewise, we are to follow a procedure that utilizes that same full advantage of our relationship as a family. Look at verses 15 to 17 in Matthew 18. Look at what that says here. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of one or two or one or two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. 
And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Now you catch that? Jesus used the word church. Now, I know a lot of people wonder when the church was established. Was, this, was the church established with the twelve when Jesus was on earth? No, it wasn't. Jesus speaks of the coming of the kingdom. We read that in Acts chapter 1, talking about verses 8 through uh, 10 in Acts chapter 1. We have to be able to look and see what he says there. He says, you know, that day's coming, that the kingdom will be established, but you've got to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And that's what they did. It was on Pen a day of Pentecost when the church started. The church, the foundation, the kingdom was established on the day of Pentecost. The foundation is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died, was buried, and resurrected 50 days before the church was established. And so he was the foundation. He was the principal foundation of that, the cornerstone of the foundation. It was Peter who would go and preach the first gospel sermon. And likewise, that church grew from 3,000 to an uncountable number in the book of Acts. Now, Jesus mentions the word here, church. The Greek word is ekklesia. You see, the ekklesia means fellowship. So what does a fellowship mean? It means the people, not the building. It doesn't matter what four walls you're in. The church are comprised of the people. The church is comprised 100% of souls, not physical building materials. And so it is imperative for us to understand that when Jesus talks about take it to the church, he is saying straight out, take it to the body of Christ. Take it to the people and share that with them so that we can help and build our erring brother back to us. And if he chooses not to be a part of it, then we have to respect his wishes and let him go. And so he needs to, and so we treat him as we would anyone who has walked away from the faith, anybody that has been lost to the faith or is wanting to be away from the faith. We have to respect their wishes. And so that is what Jesus teaches us. We are to discipline one another and encourage one another. But there is also one, one thing that I think a lot of congregations miss. This is one that is very, very hard for anybody who is in the church to do. Forgiving one another. You see, realizing that the value of our family relationship means that we are intimate, we need to be willing to have forgiveness. Forgiveness is to be automatic upon repentance. If somebody admits they've done wrong, we need to be willing to forgive them. Yes, I know we will be have those memories of who they were or if they hurt us and how hard that hurt is. We need to be able, though, to stay true, to be firm, to dig in and be able to be willing to forgive and allow them the freedom that comes from being forgiven, just as God has forgiven us. We need to be kind to one another, and as Ephesians goes and says, we are to be kind to one another, and remember that when we forgive others, we should be doing that just as God has forgiven us. We should be willing to do that. It should be automatic. Read Matthew chapter 18 here, verses 21 to 22. Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often, should, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Well, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times. I say 70 times seven. Be willing to forgive your brother no matter how often. He goes and hurts you. Now, I know I have brothers and a, I have three brothers and a sister. I love them very much. I know I'm the youngest of the family, so I caused a lot of strife and a lot of problems for them, whether it was breaking records, whether it was going and, and destroying some property of theirs or uh, getting, into, getting into something that I shouldn't have gotten into and mom and dad finding out or running my sister's boyfriends off or anything like that. I was always causing some kind of grief to my brothers and sister. At the same time, no matter what seemed to happen, they loved me. 
They cared about me. Even if they were far off, it didn't matter. They still loved me. Why? Because we're family. No matter how much property we might destroy of one another, no matter how hard it might be to get over some things, we still love each other because we're family. We care about each other because we're family. And that is what is essential. It's the same way with the body of Christ. We are to love one another as a family. We are to encourage each other as a family. And we are willing and should be willing to not keep a tally of all the mistakes that were made, but to be able to wipe that list clean just as God has. We are to keep in mind how our Father has forgiven us and that our forgiveness by God is contingent on our forgiveness of our brethren. You can check that out here in verses 23 to 35. Look at that. As he goes and he tells the parable of the king. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wishes to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was bought to him and owed him 10,000 talents. And since he couldn't pay that, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him his debt. But when the same servant found, uh, went out, he found one of, the ser- one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I'll pay you. He refused and went and put him into prison until he should pay that debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported him to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have the mercy of your, on your fellow servant and as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debts. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. It is imperative that we are willing to forgive our brothers, forgive our sisters, forgive our family members, because if we don't, God will remember that. God is going to remember how he has forgiven us and how we need to forgive others. It is so important that we take time out to forgive and let God's grace rule our family, both in the physical family and our spiritual family. And then there is another aspect to the family. We're to serve one another. If you want to read over in Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28, You can go and read about how Jesus responded to that. That's over in Matthew 20, chapter 20, verse 25 to 28. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be First among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus, our big brother, our older brother, came in, and he didn't come to be served. He didn't come to be worshipped. He came to serve. So we are to serve one another just as Jesus did for us. And we would in our physical, as anybody would do in their physical family, be willing to go and carry the load with them. The old saying goes, he ain't heavy, he's my brother. (laughs) And that is so true with us today. We need to be willing to hold up and help our brothers and our sisters as the body of Christ, just as Jesus does for us. He carries the burden for us. And so we should be willing to do the same for those that we love and call brothers and sisters in Jesus. All of these things emphasize an important spiritual truth. The church is to be such a fellowship of believers that it can be rightly considered as a home away from home, 
and a home which is our true home. You see, allow me to expand on that in our, that last thought when I go and I say that the church is our true home. We've got this to look forward to when we get into heaven. This home, this physical family that we're a part of now, our brothers and our sisters, our husbands and our wives, our children and our grandbabies, they are a part of our physical family. And we want them to be a part of our spiritual family too, the church. The church is going to be a part of that. The cost of discipline, though, can be, or the cost of this discipleship can be great. It can be very expensive for anybody. To be born in the family is one thing. To be a disciple of the church is a whole nother thing. We are adopted in by the love of God, but sometimes our families, our physical families, don't approve of it. In some cases, it might even forsake our earthly family. I'm reminded of a young man who attends a congregation not too far from here. His family did not believe in God as many of the Christian church folks would. They had their own worship style. They had their own principles and their own way of thinking. And they did not approve of their son going to a church. But he started going to a Christian church. And soon... His Christian church family started loving him, encouraging him, building him up, and teaching him the good news of Jesus Christ. He said he'd never heard it before. He never experienced that before. His mom and his dad got so angry that they disowned him for a period of time. They said, no, we don't want you to be a part of our family. If you're going to be with them, that's fine, but you're not going to be with us. And so he had to make a very hard decision. And at that time, he went and he said, I am going to live a Christian life. I am going to believe. I'm going to repent. I'm going to confess. I'm going to be baptized. And I'm going to walk as a Christian walks. And he did that. And his Christian family adopted him in, took care of him. And I consider that young man not just a brother here on earth, a young man that I can grab hold of and hug and handshake and be a part of his family there, but as a part of the spiritual family that will go on into eternity. He is part of the family of God. And Christ intends for his church family to be just like that. I consider that young man to be part of my family. And likewise, members of that congregation, members of our congregation here at Greensburg, members at the Mount Gilead Christian Church that I serve at, those congregations are part of that family too, and we accept him in as part of that family. Whether it be the cost of putting Christ before family, maybe even the, Christ, uh, the cost of leaving a family to serve in Christ as missionaries do, Christ has promised us a hundredfold in replacement. He has guaranteed that we would have a loving, caring, compassionate family no matter what obstacles we confront. And likewise, we are to do that to our brothers and sisters in Christ and have compassion and love for them and help build them and strengthen them as this intimate family should. You see, the church can be a home away from home and it can be a home for all especially for those that are away from home, say like young ones that are going to college. You're, if you're in a college town and you're going and you're outreaching to people, you can go and make that church home their home away from home. Help them have a place to be able to be restored and encouraged. Or maybe maybe their families that, that haven't had family at all. Maybe they don't have a mom or dad. Or maybe they just have one mom and one dad. And they come from those households that have been broken. And whether they be orphans or single-parent households, we can love them and encourage them that same way. Or maybe they come from a dysfunctional family. Maybe they've come from a family that has alcohol abuse in it or uh, sexual abuse in it or drug abuse in it. Whatever the case is, those dysfunctional families need to know that the church is part of their home too. And we will accept them in and treat them just as we would our families and love them, build them up, and strengthen them in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, the church is to be the home Christ intended, the family that Christ intended, and family members must do their part. And for some, that might mean making a few changes. 
You see, building family intimacy in the church requires us to make some changes at points in times. We are to spend more time with each other. For some, it may mean that we need to be more faithful in intending, uh, attending worship services. You know, you don't miss a meal. I know I don't, uh, but... You don't miss a meal. You don't want to miss a meal any time during the day. Just like that, you should have that willingness to not miss the services because they're as vital to you as nutrition is, as physical nutrition is, spiritual nutrition. It's part of coming together and being a part of something greater. For others, it might mean widening our circle of fellowship. It might mean that we don't just hang out with our husband and wife in church. We need to be able to go and hang out with uh, John and Tracy and Jonathan and, and Cody and all these other guys that are over here on the side that seem to be sitting by themselves. Maybe we need to expand into their territory and reach out to them and hug on them and love on them. Let them know that we consider them part of our family. And that also means for all of us, we need to be a lot less self-centered, a lot less self-centered, and be more willing to become involved with the concerns of others. We may need to become more involved in the work of the church family. Trust me, there are lots of opportunities to be able to serve and grow in this family. Our task is not just to create some sort of social club where people can assemble, but a family of believers who are active in doing God's will, including saving souls, restoring the erring, and edifying the saved. Indeed, reconciling all with the Father and His family. So we need to provide the appropriate service, which in turn builds that intimacy, such as with preaching and teaching, exhorting and restoring, and ministering to the needs of the family, both spiritual and physical. It is imperative for us to be an intimate household. What are we doing to see that the church is fulfilling its design to be that? Are we doing all we can? Because if we're not doing anything, or if we are depriving others of trying to become close to us, then we need to go and change something. Because we are depriving ourselves of one of the greatest blessings that is found in Christ and we could also be given the impression that we may be false disciples in Christ. Brethren, we need to work harder at being the kind of family God would be proud of and God would want us to be. If becoming a child of God is your need today, if you need to accept Jesus Christ, consider what Paul wrote about becoming the sons of God in Galatians 3, 26 and 27. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you have a decision to follow Jesus Christ, believe, repent, confess, be baptized and walk in the newness of life. Be changed, just like that young man in that other congregation. He didn't worry what his family thought. He knew that he had a family, a family that loved him very much and were willing to do anything they could to make him part of a greater family. Maybe you want to rededicate yourself to loving Jesus Christ. Maybe something I said made you want to change. Maybe you saw that Maybe I'm not being intimate enough with the family. And you think that you need to be that intimacy and you need to have that. If you do, go ahead and rededicate yourself to following Jesus Christ. Go ahead, repent, turn your life back over to him. Turn around and start chasing after God. Or maybe you've been challenged. Maybe something that was said here today inspires you to make a change that challenges. Maybe you want to be a leader in your church. Maybe you want to be a stronger disciple in the church. Maybe you want to go and help others. Maybe you want to coordinate that. Maybe you want to get people together to do uh, missionary runs or go out and knock on people's door and help and encourage them. Maybe you want to make meals for people who are lost and who are hurting. Whatever the case is, whatever the challenge is, 
take that up with Jesus Christ today. I hope to see you again soon. If you have any questions, you can feel free to message me on facebook.com slash brother Robbie. Be glad to talk with you about more about Jesus and his kingdom. Until we see each other again next time, God bless you, take care, and have a great week. Hey, are you interested in apologetics and examining why God's word is historically accurate and true? Get your free copy of our ebook, Arrogant or Accurate at www.myllbia.com today.